All right, everyone. So today we're moving on to our next unit in AP World History, and it is called Consequences of Industrialization. However, I think it's more appropriately termed to be called imperialism, which is going to be one of the main causes of industrialization. So today we're going to talk about the rationales of imperialism from 1750 to 1900. So in this uh, lecture, your essential question is identify and explain the justifications used by the imperializing countries to acquire territories and subjugate the indigenous populations. So it's a basic context behind this, you know, industrialization happens and ultimately is going to lead to what we call the age of imperialism. Um, and so um, while colonies and, and countries taking over territory is not something new, uh, it also is going to be slightly different in this era as we'll talk about some of those differences uh, in this lecture and of course in the next. So industrialization itself is made more possible, um, sorry, not industrial, but imperialism is made more possible because the ability to have new technologies like transportation technology, as well as military technology to be able to subjugate uh, lands and people under the rule of these empires that are building up. And the need for raw materials is going to be essential for these building empires that continue to industrialize. And so this is a big motivating factor for why this happened, something we'll get into a little more detail about in the later part of the lecture. Okay, so what is imperialism? And I've said this word a lot, you're gonna need to know it. So basically it's a new form of empire building to put it very simply. And you're gonna see a lot of it in the late 19th and then kind of all the way to the mid 20th century. And you will start to see European and later on the United States and Japan dominate, exert their dominance over other lands uh, around the world, either by fully taking them over, like annexing them into the country or simply kind of holding their thumb over the rulers who are there, kind of putting in place puppet governments that will be more economically favorable to them. And so this is something that occurs a lot uh, during this time period. And we're going to talk about more specific examples in our next lecture at 6.2. But today we're going to mainly focus on what justified them from, to do this? Uh, why did they think this was uh, righteous of them in some way? So the curriculum of the the whole college board would be a range of cultural, religious, and racial ideologies were used to justify imperialism, including social Darwinism, nationalism, and the concept of civilizing missions, and the desire to religiously convert indigenous populations. So we're going to look at uh, some of these more specifically, and I want to point the attention to this particular cartoon, um, and it is really embodies like the idea behind some of these uh, countries, how they feel that they are, in a sense, bringing them to civilization. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But we're gonna start with eugenics, uh, and well, not eugenics, social Darwinism, okay? And scientific racism. So Darwinism is kind of termed after the ideas uh, put forth by the famous naturalist, Charles Darwin, um, in which he kind of came up with the basic biological principles of evolution, of survival of the fittest, and creating the kind of the stronger species that survive in time. It gets kind of taken and, and applied to a more social sense uh, in the how it, you know, the explanations for how certain people succeed very well in, in society and some people don't. Sometimes thinking that uh, they are born with certain natural abilities that allow them to rise to the cream of the crop at the top. And that is something that is will happen to be a huge um, uh, justification uh, in some areas for why the super wealthy would be able to continue to hang on to their wealth because they believe that social Darwinism kind of selected them to be more successful and in this idea of the survival of the fittest. But... It also encourages the development of what we call scientific racism. And so where this is a pseudoscience that does exist uh, in the late 1800s and all the way to the early 1900s, even Adolf Hitler used a lot of these conceptual ideas about there's a scientific uh, proof that certain races are just predispositioned to be better and more intelligent and more capable. Now, all of this is clearly debunked by today's standards. Um, science has, has overwhelmingly found the evidence to the contrary of the beliefs of these. But there are two scientific fields that did exist during this time, eugenics being one of them. And it was the study of how, like, of human breeding. 
And it kind of did, uh, you know, said that it was mainly important that certain human groups need to stay within their own um, race and, and, and to keep bloodlines pure um, and to make sure that there were characteristics that they regard as desirable based off of those races in general. Um, and there was also phrenologists who were kind of studying the, the skull and the shape of the skull. And um, they would study shapes of skulls of people. And they would think that, well, if this person has this part of the skull a little larger, then they would have more capable uh, capabilities and certain understandings of sciences and other things. And all these ideas, these scientific uh, fields of pseudoscience, really, uh, primarily come from Europe and North America. So you can't really be all that surprised when they like determine that what they saw in their scientific discovery is that white Europeans uh, were considered the you know superior race as far as intelligence and capability and so forth. Now, it's, it's really insulting to hear and really I hate talking about it, but it really was something that was a, a belief of this time and era. Uh, and it uh, certainly many people, um, Americans, uh, Europeans, uh, Japanese, believed that this whole idea basically justified why they should be able to subjugate people of different races in different parts of the world. So this is just one example of you know the the justifications that were used for imperialism, but certainly it's not the only one. So we also need to talk about nationalism. And so where are you talking about Europe and the rising sense of nationalism? This is something that's been happening for quite some time, um, especially in Western Europe. And you have very strong competing countries like France, Britain, Germany. Um, the United States is competing in some sense as well. Japan's going to be competing in some sense. And so as they industrialize, uh, you know, they are you know, more capable of taking more lands and land and, and territory holdings um, help kind of represent power, prestige. The more lands you hold, you know, the more the balance of power weighs in your favor on the world stage. But you also, you know, there's there's other things that come with that. You know, if you're trying to build this mighty empire of great military capabilities, you need enough resources. And the more lands you have, the more access to resources you have, the more people you have to be able to um, you know, put into your armies and militaries and so forth. So, you know, territorial acquisitions was something of a high desire by many of these nations as they looked across the globe to find more lands. They would find them in places like Africa and Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Oceania, and they would begin to colonize them, claiming them part of the empire. And they were talk more in detail about the areas in which these countries will subjugate under imperialism uh, and take control over. But to give you a general sense at this point, Australia, India, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, Burma, which is now modern day Myanmar, and the Malay states, which includes what is now modern day Singapore, um, were all some you know countries, uh, well, territories, I should say at the time, um, that were under the control or at least kind of within the sphere of influence of the British Empire. France, too, also undertook this. They had places like Algeria, South Pacific, Senegal, Indochina, South and Southeast Asia. You know, all of these areas were kind of under the influence of the French as well. Japan, too, would also expand and have their own um, kind of industrial country uh, or industrial um empire that is is needing of new resources so you know they invade in korea in 1910 uh, formosa and taiwan they wrestle away from control from in portugal so yeah there's there's a lot going on here and and i'll talk more detail in our next slide about um, our next t uh, lecture about some of these areas there's also a sense by some of these uh civilizations that are are taking partaking in imperialism is that they were just culturally superior to to the people that they were subjugating, and it's it's easy for them to make the mistake that because they had technological superiority over the people that they do um, you know subjugate, it, they they tend to make the conclusion draw the conclusion that their culture is just superior in every way as well. 
And so as they imperialize these countries and these people and subjugate them, um, oftentimes, you know, when they're superimposing borders around these areas, they would include areas that are multi-ethnic and multilingual. And so the language of the imperialized uh, imperial country um, would then end up becoming the language that would unify that area. So if you go to places in Africa and, uh, you know, Southeast Asia today, you know, there's uh, places that speak English, speak French. Um, and their colonial languages still are, are something of a, a taught language uh, today. So it is, is, this is not surprising at all, you know, where you see when they arrive, they believe that they're there to help them, to help civilize them. And so that often meant that they are going to superimpose their cultural ideologies and cultures onto people, asking them to give up their, their old beliefs in favor of theirs. And so you'll see political, economic, educational, religious, architectural, and recreational activities be kind of superimposed onto the the people of uh, that they have imperialized, right? And in, in a good example, of that is the picture right here in the lower right hand side. That is the game of cricket. Now, if you ask me how cricket works, I can say there's a ball, there's a big flat bat. Someone throws it at the ground and bounces off. The guy tries to hit it, and then everybody off field tries to catch it. That's about the extent of cricket, what I know as the game itself. But what I do know is that cricket is going to be an extremely popular game in places that were former colonies of Britain, including the two teams that you see playing against each other here in the, the picture, which is India and Pakistan. Both India and Pakistan were part of the, the India, uh, the British Empire when it ruled over it. And uh, it certainly uh, is something that stuck with them in the um, the empire itself um, or it, within India it is as a game that they continue to play. And I don't know if it is the national sport, but it is one of the most popular sports in India still today. There's also a lot of religious motives and what's going on and um, why they want to um, why imperialism can be justified is that there would be these civilizing missions and that is a term you absolutely should know um, but the civilizing missions themselves were uh, missionaries who went out to not only teach about christianity and mostly it's protestant missionaries which is a shift from previous eras of history which we talked about you know when the catholics and the portuguese took over territories across the world they brought with them missionaries too and they to help christianize but you know it was catholicism that they brought with them the franciscan and jesuits in a much lesser sense the gregorian um missionaries um but they were the ones who originally brought uh christianity to some of these lands but then we have protestants who are coming and they're not just bringing the religion and trying to encourage people to give up their traditional beliefs of ancestral veneration and animism in favor of protestant christianity but they're also setting up schools to teach them both like you know secular subjects and religious matters um they're bringing um medical care they're bringing their culture to teach them, you know, new ways of life, you know, how to farm, how to build houses and things like that, and kind of bringing it onto them um, and, and really superimposing it. And while you can make an argument that there is some benefits for people who do, um, you know, end up being visited by missionaries and kids being able to go to missionary schools and things like that, um, you can't deny the fact that it, it is going to change their cultural identity as a result of that. So there are some examples of uh, civilizing missions that were undertook. The one person I think would be a good example to remember would be Dave Livingston. Um, and Livingston was a Scotsman um, who was a missionary who um, went to Africa, I believe South Africa, um, to help with the civilizing mission. And in his time there, he fought to help try to end the illegal slave trade that still existed in Africa. Um, the British had already outlawed it in, I believe, 1807. Um, but they would then end up, um, kind of, he would end up kind of trying to help end the illegal slave trade and such. And was he fully successful? Honestly, I don't know. But it was something that he did fight for. Then there's the economic motives, and this may be one of the big primary reasons for why imperialism really did happen. And with the industrialization as, you know, the need for more raw materials, as well as markets to sell to without, you know, playing run-up tariffs um, from other countries that you trade with, 
they are going to, you know, take control of these lands so they have more access to raw materials. I mean, hey, England is a, a country that was, you know, started because they had raw materials of things like coal and iron that helped with the industrial age. But as the industrial age, you know, continues to go on, uh, oil, um, rubber, these are things that are not going to be able to get inside um you know england and so as a result they need to go find it elsewhere and so going over and taking new land and and making it so that they can get access to these raw materials was really really important to them so it led to the creation of more trading posts more building of ports um you also have large infrastructure projects like the suez canal that was built in egypt that connected the mediterranean sea and the red sea making the trip much shorter instead of going all the way around the the cape of good hope in africa and then you know the panama canal was something that the americans ended up finishing building they didn't start it but they did finish it um and that helped save the trip uh, for all the way around the tip of South America. And so this saved time, it saved money, it saved fuel, it is a lot of economic benefits to having these huge infrastructure projects to be able to use uh, those waterways to be able to move large amounts of, of materials and resources and people. Um, they also build a lot of railroads and then consolidating these empires as well as telegraphs to try to make it possible so that they could um, you know, uh, take these raw materials and to be able to bring them from the interior of these continents that they are imperialized to the coast where they can be put on ships and sent back to whatever country that they originate um, from. Well, where they want to send them to, so to say. Okay. So like, just like in these pictures here, you can see, you know, this is the subcontinent of India. And you can see all these railroads kind of crisscross across the entire continent and such and that so that they can move people and materials and resources across the vastness of the land and and those those rail lines still exist today and maintained by um the india and pakistani governments railroads also existed in places like you know southeast asia but also africa as you can see the large railroad lines that were built and this was to allow them to the opportunity to be able to bring raw materials from more from the interior of africa to the coastline to send them off. Um, there was at one time the idea of a, um, a rail line that would connect Cairo, Egypt, all the way down to South Africa, connecting all of the uh, British colonies that kind of connected here. But it never came to fruition. But you can see they did build quite a, a large amount of railroads for their own benefit. So that's really kind of, you know, in a nutshell, what happens here. There are a few things that we haven't talked about that will you know, doing an assignment for um, later on, but uh, one is going to be the white man's burden. And I'll talk more about that um, next class period. Um, but that is, in a nutshell, what uh, the justifications um, and rationale for imperialism. So go ahead and take some time to answer the essential question and submit through Canvas. And our next lecture, there will not be an essential question, but there will be something that you are expected to submit. And I will talk about that when we get there. Uh, other than that, this is Mr. Henry signing off.